Hello and welcome, I'm Erin Cuthbert, footballer for Chelsea and the Scotland national team and you're listening to the Blue Day podcast. Welcome back, my friends, to the podcast that never ends. And yes, this is the Blue Day podcast. And for those of you that are wondering why we are doing this special episode, well, not only is it because of this, the podcast's second anniversary, but this is a very truly special episode because we're going to talk about one man. There's only one topic to discuss, and it's not the defeat against Dinamo Zagreb. It's not the horrible defeats against Leeds and Southampton or the lucky win against West Ham. No, it's the news, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Thomas Tuchel, the man who has won us the Champions League, the UEFA Super Cup and the Club World Championships, has gone. He's left the club. My guest at this time is a former Chelsea defender, a man who bleeds blue every time he got onto the field of play back in the 70s and 80s. My good friend, my good colleague, Steve Wicks. Steve, welcome to the show. Hello, Jake. This is not what we was going to discuss on this show, was it, when we had our first chat yesterday? <laughs> Yeah, last night we had the chat, and it wasn't the, uh, you know, I think I think there are circumstances that that have made this happen. And um, the one thing I've got to say is, uh, as a an ex Chelsea player, is that he bought trophies to the club that I'd never ever thought Chelsea would ever win. When I say that, he Champions League, World Club Championship, Super Cup, he. There's got to be a place in our hearts for him for what he's achieved at our football club. I agree with that. And I think when you look at the response from Chelsea fans, I mean, my phone this morning, to say it was pinging for hours is a bit of an understatement. It was constant messages from people from all over the world. And again, we have to look at it from... uh, Business perspective, Chelsea is a... I hate using this term, but Chelsea is a global brand. And there are millions of people out there that want to have their say. And a lot of people, from what I can see through the grapevine, a lot of people are shocked because of the timing. Other people saw it coming. And I was there against Leeds. We were dog. We were dreadful. I was there against Southampton. We were terrible. We were just... We just looked 11 men and no team ethos at all. I'm a little bit shocked with the timing. I thought he would have got a little bit longer. But from what it seems through the grapevine, and again, we we won't know the full ins and outs of it, but we do know some snippets, is that the board seemed to have wanted to do this months ago. And it seemed that things weren't all rosy in the camp in the summer. Could that be one of the reasons why a certain Cristiano Ronaldo did not come to Chelsea because owner wanted him or manager did not want him? Is there a reason why we perhaps overspent on Mark Cucurella and Wesley Fofana? All these questions, and it's come to pass about Tuchel's gone. We we, we will touch on the Dinamo Zagreb game later, but... We were horrible last night. Well, I didn't watch the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll explain later. And you t- actually rung me last night to talk about it. And you said that you was hearing it on the radio. And you said we were poor. Bang average, poor. The performances this season hasn't been great. The performances at the end of last season hasn't been great. Who's to blame? People will say it's the players. I hear in people saying that Kai Havertz is one of the worst players to put on a Chelsea shirt. Certain people's opinion. I've heard people say that Hakim Ziyech should have left the club when he did. Ross Barkley had his contract terminated. They're saying that Hakim Ziyech should do the same. 
there's a lot of outcry. There's a lot of issues. But the interesting thing is, Steve, is that this isn't new to us. We have been doing this since 2004. Well, even before, even before that, when you look at the managers that have Chelsea have let go, you've been in sides that Chelsea have let go of the managers out of the blue. Mm. Eddie McCready in 77, for example. Yeah. John Neal in the 80s, for example. Chelsea have had this thing about getting rid of managers. Viali in 2000. Well, so it's, it's, it's not new to the club, but the fact okay. that... A lot of people, go on, Steve, go on. A lot of people in those years um, all got the sack because they become more popular than Ken Bates. That was the problem. <laughs> when a man got popular and the, the crowd loved him, Bates couldn't stand that. And players were players like Viali, he was a god with 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 the uh, Chelsea fans, he, he got the sack. Uh, and that was, you know, with this one, it's more complex, I think, than people appreciate. The one thing you've got to ask yourself is, did the manager want the players that have been signed? That's the interesting point, because it's been reported, whether or not this is legit or not, but it has been reported by Sky Sports News. And at this, in this day and age, you should take it with a pinch of salt, because... How many decent journalists or news outlets can you really trust at these days? But they're reporting that it was more the ownership that wanted players like Cucurella, like Sterling, like Fafana, for example. You don't really have to look at someone like Aubameyang that seemed like a Tuchel signing. Even the young players that are coming, for, the young players that we bought, the young lad from Villa, over £20 million we spent on him. Yeah. Does that sound like a two call signing? Probably. No, I, listen, I don't think it does, Keith. And, and, no. and you know, I, I think with all due respect, he's a German. He had a great relationship with the German players. And I look at what we've paid. If there, <laughs> if there was Kukurea and Chilwell, I sign Chilwell every day of the week mm. over that player. Mm. Um, you know, I feel that that it's almost been like a, a scattergun signing period where there's not a lot of thought because all I'm saying, all through the, the, the pre-season, if you like, we need a centre forward. We need someone, a focal point of our club. Now, if you look at it, and you look at what's happened over the last three months. Well, not that. If you go back into last season. It was longer. It's from the we, end of last um, season we've been needing a centre forward. Punchless. There's no edge to our game attacking-wise at all. Hmm. We play the ball. We play ourselves into oblivion with square passes. There's no midfield players that look early and put front players in. It's so easy to play against because it's all in front of you. And that's why we go to Leeds. That's why teams that wouldn't get near us in the past. Can you, I'll tell you something now. Under the way we've been playing over the last eight months, did a Drogba would have been a flop. Would have been a flop because the service that those front players get is so late and so slow. Our build-up is slow. Now, with Didier, the ball was over the top. Bang, he was gone. He's after it. He's power and pace. The team today wouldn't no. wouldn't use his pace. And, you know, is that why everyone that gets that number nine shirt, it's almost like someone said the other day, the number nine shirt, jinx. It's not jinx, it's just that they're making runs. I've said this over and over again on our podcast. And the ball's not coming. So what do they do? They stop making the runs. And that's the problem with Chelsea. We go to a third-rate Champions League game last night that we would have won over and over and over again in the past. 3-0. 
over and over and over again. But we're so slow in our build-up. And what I think we've done as well with the change of, of ownership, we haven't got rid of the players we should have got rid of. They're still here. Zelic, you know, Pulisic. They've been here for a long time and they've not achieved anything. Well, not, well, you know, Pulisic is longer than Zelic. But Zelic, he, he's not the right player for Chelsea. And also, we got this thing of playing, you know, Mason Mount is one of my favourite boys. He is an absolute, to me, has been class. What's happened to him? Yeah. What has happened to him? Gallagher is a third of the player that played at Crystal Palace last year. What's happened to him? Number one, they're being played out of position. But it seems to me that, that there's a real... We've gone backwards. Yes. Backwards. Agreed uh, with that. We've gone backwards. And there comes a time where you've got to look at it and say, right, with all the things going wrong, with all the question marks there are, bearing in mind that, you know, the manager's had a big problem with his personal life. You know, he's got, he's had a That should factor in, yes, of course. You yes. know, and he hasn't been the same. He hasn't been the same. In all his interviews, really, he's been very... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Timid. He hasn't yeah. been the same. He hasn't been the same. He hasn't been the Ooh, same. But, look at the reaction with him and Conte the other week. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. Has that built up some frustration? <laughs> was there an issue then between him and the ownership, which is why he got... Or apart from Anthony Taylor being a crook and a cheat and whatever, but could there be stuff behind the scenes because of it? I just feel that, again, as you said at the top of the show, Tuchel should be remembered for the fact that that game against Man City in the Champions League final, tactically, I don't think anybody else could have done any better. No, no, I, I think his tactics... I thought he was outstanding that night. Yeah, I think his tactics uh, in those in those days... We had Manchester City. We've been a couple of times where his tactics won us the game. Mm. Um, and but what has happened over the last... He hasn't been the same man. He hasn't been the same man. And I'm, as a, an ex-player, and, and I'm looking at signings that we're doing, and I'm thinking, that is not a Chelsea signing. That is not... It seems to me, because... Man City wanted him, uh, uh, you know, Cucurella. It's like, oh, he must be a good player. Whatever it takes, we're buying. But Man City stopped at 40. They were going to pay a penny more. And I just think because Man City wanted him and everyone, you know, who was the player key? I've been going on about for two years on who we should sign. And if you get this wrong, I'm leaving. <laughs> Who was the centre forward? Would that be a certain striker oh, starting with R and beginning and ending with Lund? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you know, we we that to me was the player we needed more than anything. Was that? Yeah, but but listen, I don't know. I, I just find well, you only have to the look at the structure. I find it so frustrating. You you only have to look at sort of the. Even the, the rumours in the summer, you said Haaland for less than 50 million. We was after Anthony Golden for 60. And you're weighing it up. Haaland, Golden. I know which one I'd pick. I think I know which one millions of Chelsea fans would pick. Yeah. But. I'm... Yeah, but Keith, we're paying. We are offer for Gordon was £60 million. Harlem was bought for £51 million. So you're talking £9 million. You could have paid towards his wages and, and, and sorted him out financially. And you're looking, Gordon? Mm. He's another... Yeah, he's a... Don't get me wrong. He's got the potential to be a good player. But he's like Werner. He misses chances as much as he scores them, you know, and there's no comparison. 
But well, Werner's not missing at the go. moment. He's been lethal for Leipzig so far. <laughs> he's well, he been... would. He would be. Yeah. But. Uh, how many goals have he scored out of interest? Pardon? How many goals have he scored? Oh. Right. Twiddle amongst yourselves, folks. I'm going to find out how many goals. Look, uh, not, well, actually, Lukaku has scored some goals, but I'll talk about. We'll find out Werner's stats at the moment. But talking about Tuchel, where where do you see him ranked as the, the you know the list of successful Chelsea managers? You know, would you see him in the top five based on what he's done, or would you say that he's you know whereabouts on the list would you put him down, Steve? Well, I think you've got to look at the, 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 the well, there's, there's one little exception for anyone that wins the Champions League. And actually, you look at the win and you know it's down to the manager's tactics and the way he set up his team. I think the Man City, when we beat Man City, I think that's probably the best example of an influence a manager has when he sets a team up against a great team and they win the game 1-0 and he must have sat down with a beer and said, you know what? My tactics today won us back up. And they did. And they did. I've got Werner's stats for this season since his return to Leipzig. Six games, four goals. Well... How many blind teams are playing in Leipzig? Oh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> you leave team. I love his interview. <laughs> I love the. No, he works hard, and to be fair, anyone that works as hard as him, you actually go to a stage where you want him to. You want him to achieve and and get goals and be a, a hit because he did work very hard, and I can't criticise him for that. But to me. Goal scorers. I, I worked with a couple of. I, you know, I met him the other day for the first time in a long time. Steve Finiston and Kerry Dixon were in the same room, and, and Clive Allen. Uh, goal scorers are natural, and um, it seems to me Werner got all up tight when the ball came to him. He had a chance of scoring, and it either went over the bar, miss kicked it. He had a nightmare for us. A nightmare, bless him. But um, going back to what you said, I think. He's definitely in the top two. Oh. I really do. Mourinho never won a Champions League. Ranieri, Ranieri never won a Champions League. We won the double. And he was sacked in... How long was it after we won the double? That Boy, it was, was one sacked. season. It was one season. Yeah. You know, so... To me, he's got to be in the top two. Conte, would you call Conte the, you know? No, uh, I'd have Conte over me, Tuchel. Well, I'll tell you something now, mate. If you ask Chelsea fans... Oh, I know what to... Chelsea fans would want, but I know, I know the difference between somebody who I think is a natural-born winner and somebody who... <sighs> You look at his track record. Dortmund, he had the perfect job. Fell out with the owners. PSG, perfect job. Fell out with the owners. Well, Fool me oh, once, oh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Hold it a minute, hold it a minute. Listen, Dortmund, I don't quite know what happened there. He won't be the first and he won't be the last to fall out. Any football club, that allows a footballer to put the rubber stamp on. T- <laughs> Hold it a minute. I think anyone, allegedly, allegedly, anything would fall out with those owners. And actually, without him, what have they done? Poch has gone there, and all right, he's won the league, or he's he's won what he's won. But the big thing is the Champions League, and he came into our football club. And he won the Champions League. <clears throat> Not many managers can say that. No, which is why I think Tuchel should be remembered for what he's done with Chelsea. Also, also Keith, what that does as well 
is I think it's really important for a football club to win their second Champions League. I think it's really important that we weren't a one season wonder. We proved that we're a football club that stands the test of time and we've won it twice. But like many things in life, Steve, you always remember your first one. Yeah, you do. And to me, that was the greatest game I have ever sat and watched. <laughs> was because to win the Champions League in Bayern Munich's home ground after being 1-0 down and to, was just, to me, unbelievable. And that was, as a Chelsea fan, that was probably my most endurable and greatest night. But what I loved about uh, what I loved about um, our win against Manchester City was we had to go on that field tactically so right, mm. and we went onto that field and the game went beautifully for the way we were playing, and our tactics won that game, and that should never be forgotten, never. Talking from a player's perspective here, Steve, which one or two players? We'll talk, go through both bits, but which one or two players do you think will have it easier, or would I say partly be pleased that Tuchel's, Tuchel's gone? And which two players do you think are now thinking to themselves, oh, my coach has gone, now what? My future might be uncertain here. Which two do you think, based on the squad we've got, which two... Do you think would be happy, or which well, two would you think be a little be a little bit concerned? Well, I think the likes of Conor Gallagher and Mason Mount will think, right. I hope the manager comes and puts me in my right position. I hope they see my strengths and play to my strengths a little bit, because um, Conor is a third of the player that he was at Crystal Palace, a third of the player. Uh, and I think in getting sent off the other week was pure frustration. In terms of, I think he was, he was trying too hard. I yeah. think he, he he was trying too hard. You you can tell that. Yeah, uh, but I think the biggest the biggest person to me who's I think probably the most full of integrity and honest kid you could have is Mason Mount. And Mason is his form. You know, you, you get so many people on. You know, Jason Kundi last night about Mason Mount not getting the England squad for the World Cup. Well, it, it's a well. Last night we was talking about it. It was at threat because he hasn't done. He hasn't produced the goods at all so yeah. far. So, so therefore, he might be happy. He might be happy because something's not right there with him, hmm. and he's not the sort of boy to cheat or to not give a hundred percent. He looks fun. He always looked happy playing football. Mason always had a smile on his face. We haven't seen much of that lately. No, uh, the games I saw against Leeds and Southampton, for for example, I forgot he was on the pitch most of the time. He just yeah. looked off it. I mean, a, a lot a lot of them did in those away games, but he in particular, he's not a winger. He's never been a winger. He's never been an inside forward. He's a centre mid. Mm. The same with Havertz. He's not a striker. And people say, I've, I've got to say about Kai, you know, everyone says, you know, that he's, when I hear people say he's the worst player to play for <coughs> for Chelsea, I, I I can't accept that. I um, I agree. I, I agree I, with your got point. All yeah. the ability, and I think he's he's got so much potential. Bear in mind, he's what twenty two? You twenty two? Twenty three? Yeah, twenty two, twenty three. Yeah, yeah. He's only a youngster in terms of, and he's learning his game. And what I'm saying to people. Is he's playing out of his position playing up front. He is a 10. Yes. He's a 10. And what we're doing, we're playing good players out of position and because they're not happy, they're losing their confidence and going in their shells, which affects the performance of Chelsea Football Club. And there's about four or five of them. The one thing I will criticise too, Cologne, and it was something that bugged me a little bit on the way back to Leeds and it was something that I did notice a little bit in other matches was when since he came in Lampard played with a four at the back and then he sort of changed changed chopped and changed a little bit. Tuchel, his first game was I believe it was against Wolves at home during the COVID season and he went straight 
three-man defence with two wing-backs. We looked defensively very assured. That season he came in, we looked very assured. Didn't concede a lot of goals. This season, he started to change it a little bit, tweak it a little bit. He had Kulabai and Thiago Silva as our two centre-backs. They were run ragged by one centre-forward in both away games that we got thumped in, what we didn't perform well in, in Leeds and Southampton. Silva's 37, but he's a, he's a fine wine. He is mat- he's matured and graced with age. Kulabai... <sighs> oh... Let me ask you a question. He's he's okay. going to take some time to gel in, I think. But Keith, Keith, let Tuchel, me ask you a question. I think, really cocked up on that one. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Go on. Kulabai, I watched the Spurs game, and I wasn't totally happy with the way he played, although we dominated the game and should have won the game. There was things in his game that I looked at, I thought, God, like the goal, the winning goal. I'm marking Harry Kane. I've got to do that right, otherwise he's going to score, right? As a centre-back, what I can't understand is the leader of our team last year was Rudiger. How hard did these new people that walked into our football club try to keep Rudiger at Chelsea? Bearing in mind, we're spending how much for Kuna Bay? How much did he cost? Don't know the figures on top of my head. I know it was a lot. Forty-five million. Was yeah. it thirty-five, forty-five million? About, what, four, about forty to fifty. I'll find out why you're discussing. Who's it. the best player, Rudiger or Kudabali? Who's the best player? So if Rudiger is the best player and had had a fantastic season with us, there's no need to spend forty million quid. Let's look after the player we've got. Let's do what we've got to do to get them on a new contract. And we've got players that have played with each other. And you're not having two months for someone to settle into the Premier League. Rudiger, as he said when he left the club, Chelsea never really tried to keep me there. He signed for £35 million. You know, yeah, and that's what I find really strange, is that we've had a guy that's been probably our, one of our best players for two years, and we haven't worked that hard to keep him. And yet we go and try and find someone who's 31 years of age, the same age as him, and pay 35 million. To me, that's... Plus not... the wages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's what I can't... And it's like, chill well. You know, to me, before he got injured, he was the best left back in this country. I could not believe that Shaw was picked over Chilwell for England. Well, that's because of Gareth Northgate. Different, different class. And yet we go out and buy a player from Brighton for 55 million quid. It is, when that 55 million quid, if we'd have gone in at the right time, we could have got Haaland. It's bizarre. This whole thing is bizarre. And I'll tell you what, I don't care what anyone says about how ruthless Roman and his team were. Every signing that they signed went into a jigsaw puzzle and fitted perfectly. Very few. Some, not all. There, there, no, there, no, were, there were some. I'm saying in the, in the good days. In the big days that made Chelsea where they were, they signed players that changed the course of history for our club. And a lot more successes than failures. There there were a few. Yeah. There, there, there were a few ones. Veron, Kesman. Oh, Kesman. But that he he is Werner's brother. <laughs> Kesman is Werner's older brother, without any doubt whatsoever. But no, yeah, they were. <laughs> You know what I mean. When the big ones, they got right. We'll talk about sort of the ramifications of what this could mean to Chelsea's season, but we'll talk about the other big news that's happening as we're recording, and that is that Chelsea are looking at three managers. 
One seems to be the serious contender, and apparently I looked at Skybet, and the odds are pretty much stacked in the favour. They've sorry, Chelsea have been granted permission by Brighton to speak to Graham Potter, and then the other two candidates is Zidane Zidane, who would be my choice, but the other choice is Mauricio Pochettino. You said last night to me on a private phone call that. You can see Poch. I've had texts of people saying to me, Poch is the man. But Graham Potter, it seems, seems to be the favourite. Your thoughts on that, Steve? I'll tell you what, Keith. Football's a funny thing. Um, David Moyes had a very limited budget at Everton. Very limited. And he worked that brilliantly. He did a marvellous job at Everton. All of a sudden he comes to Man United and he's got money to spend. And it didn't go too well. He didn't get, all of a sudden, he he bought the guy, he was a midfield player, the big tall guy from Belgium. Fellaini. Yeah, and um, it didn't work out for him. So I think there are managers that are very, very good working on a limited budget in a certain environment which suits them, he hasn't worked in a situation where he's dealing with the type of players he's going to deal with at Chelsea. Now, he might be a great success. And to me, as a guy, and how he comes across, I'd run through a, a, a brick wall for him. I, I would. I'd say, to me, he comes across brilliantly, and every I've not heard a bad word about him. Hmm. I've always said, and I will always stick by, that the one person that I see as a Chelsea manager is Poch. Is Poch. But I know there's a lot of Chelsea fans out there that don't want him to be manager. But he came very close to winning the league and Champions League with Tottenham. Um, and although he missed out, my God, to be in that position was a great achievement because he had one of the smallest budgets you'd have. And um, he did really well at Tottenham. And he did well at Southampton. He went to PSG. And as I said, that job is something else. <laughs> you know, um, so... But in terms of handling a club and a big club like Chelsea and players like Chelsea have, which are a few grades above Brighton players, that's a big step for someone. And to me, this is yet another example of our new owners being slightly naive and not understanding football. If he's been offered the job, you've got to take it, really. Well, Cause... he's got to, to do it, number one, it'll make him for life. It will make him financially secure for life. Financially, I think he'll be fine. But I was more referring to, and you've seen it in football, if you get offered a job like this where, but again, you look at the, the law of the land when it comes to clubs, Brighton or Chelsea, come on. If you get offered a job like this and you turn it down, how many other jobs are going to be out there in the future? You don't know. You only have to look at certain managers. One season, they could be great. They could be the best thing since sliced bread. Other seasons, they'd, they'd want you out. You only have to look at someone like Brendan Rodgers to see that. I wouldn't be surprised, and it seems that things are going to be escalating to the point where Potter might even be confirmed before the weekend. Maybe, I don't know. Evidently, they've agreed to compensation. Yeah, it looks as if the compensation is going to be agreed. And, you know, if he if he gets offered the job, I think Chelsea fans will be a little bit, I think some will be underwhelmed. But I think when you look at the strategy that the American owners might want for the club, there's got to be a reason. And I've been thinking about this all summer. The fact that they've spent a lot of money on youth. Yeah. You look at someone like Potter, who has brought in young players to Brighton, 
like Tarek Lamptey, for example, the midfielder, Sacido, who's been linked now with top clubs. He's nurtured them. He's made them proper players. Todd reminds me, and I don't know the guy. I'm probably never going to meet him. He reminds me of somebody who's playing football manager. Yeah. He reminds me someone like that. I hope Graham does well. If he gets off of the job, I wouldn't be surprised if he takes it. Good luck to him. But uh, where, where are we going as a club? Yeah. Well, this is, this is the thing. Where are we going? And it did seem, from what it said uh, recently in the news, if the board wanted to get rid of two call in the summer, why didn't they? Why didn't they just cut ties at the end of the season and go, right, you was the manager, the old regime, the season's finished. Thank you for getting us to this point, but we want to go in a different direction. Why didn't they because, do it then? I'll tell you why, because they, they, they're, they're looking at the first opportunity of not people saying, oh my God, they're rash. So what they're doing is they're playing mind games and they let them go, let them go, let them go, and they think, that's all right. People are, understand that we want, uh, and he's in a situation where a few Chelsea fans who don't know the game that well will say, "Let's get rid of him," and they oblige. And they but then just, there was news coming. There were stories and rumours coming out that Tuchel was going to be offered an extended contract yeah, three yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Less than a month ago, he was. There was talks about him staying for another three, four years. The board were allegedly happy with him. Now, was if, that smoke and mirrors? Yeah. If Graham Potter lost five games at Brighton, he wouldn't get the sack. If hmm. Graham Potter loses five games at Chelsea, he's Sense. under pressure. That's what he hasn't dealt with. That's the difference of running Chelsea Football Club and running Brighton Football Club. If Brighton stay up with 41 points, he would be consider, considered a success. What he's done is he looked, he, what he's done, he's done a great job and they look good. And, but I've always found with Brighton that they always have a good spell and my God, they have a bad spell. Now, in that bad spell, that would have cost a Chelsea manager their job. That's the difference between Chelsea Football Club and Brighton Football Club. On the top of your head, Steve, do you think if Graham Potter came to Chelsea, Chelsea would still be regarded as a top team whereby we would be competing for league titles and European Cups? Or do you think that we could be going through a different stage to the point where the American owners see this as an opportunity to build from the ground up? So we'll go for a younger manager. We'll go for somebody who's done it before, albeit in different situations. And he did do it at Swansea to an extent as well. He did start building a team, a young team to sort of play attractive, decent football and build from that. Do you think Chelsea, the owners at Chelsea are trying to change that? Because if they are, I fear for some of the older players at Chelsea. What, this what, is it. what what direction are they going to take? Because at the moment they're just going through, they're just going through the motions at the moment. Well, I don't think they're going through. I think they've got someone's advising them somewhere. I don't know who it is, but someone's advising these people somewhere. Um, and you know, Graham Potter has done a magnificent job at Brighton, but to keep. Get good results at Brighton is very different to playing Real Madrid away, to playing PSG away. What experience has he had at yeah. that level of football? That's why we say that the Contes of this world, the Tuchers of this world, um, the Klops of this world and the Peps of this world are what we consider world-class managers because they've dealt with that all their careers. Being in the Champions League, having pressure to win the Champions League, um, you know, that's what world class managers are all about. Graham Potter, to me, is someone that I could play for, that I'd run through a barn door for. But you got to ask yourself, 
is he ready for the Champions League? Is he ready to take on Man City and Liverpool at the level where people won't think a draw is good enough? They want to beat Liverpool. They want to beat Man City. They want to beat Real Madrid in the Bernabeu Stadium. Very different, very different mentality. You mentioned earlier about Moyes. And somebody actually, while my phone was boiling hot while I was driving, I was looking, looked at the messages when I parked up. One of the messages, messages that came to me was, this seems like a Graham Potter coming into Chelsea, seems like a Moyes-ish type of deal. And it stuck to me because I'm thinking of the players. You see, look at someone like Jorginho, Kante, even Thiago Silva to an extent, who's seen it all and done it all. Are they going to look at Graham Potter and think, who's this guy? The similar to what Man United did with David Moyes. When you look at certain players that were there and have won many, many trophies, they looked at Moyes and thought, why are you telling me how to defend like an Everton player? Could it be similar to that? Um, yeah, yeah, it could be. It all depends, you know. And I, I um, there is a, a superstar mentality in football where, you know, I had it at Crystal Palace. There was a row in the dressing room, and someone turned around to, to Dario Grady, who'd never played professional football, and he said, "What do you know about? You, you've never played the game. What do you know?" There is that sort of mentality within a football club and it's grown to you know you know Ronaldo's attitude Mm. so all of a sudden Graham Potter's got to deal with that he's got to deal with that type of player with that type of attitude and that's very different to dealing with players that appreciate the platform they've been given by him at Brighton and love the success they're having at Brighton but very, very rarely do Brighton go through a season where all of a sudden they don't all of a sudden become relegation candidates. And they've always won the game that they've needed to win, which sparked them off to get out of the league again. Now, I don't know. Yes, he's having a great season this year. But a couple of years ago, they had a great season and started off like this. But still ended up 16th, 17th, 18th. Well, not 18th, but... 50, I know what you mean. Yeah, they had a bit of a down spell. Yeah. yeah. And that's what he's got to understand. You can't lose six games at Chelsea and expect to have your job. Hmm. And it's proven that with, with, you know, we're five points off the top of the table. We've had a nightmare start. So does that mean if Klopp gets beaten tonight in Napoli, he's going to get a sack? <sighs> Liverpool. They haven't done much to start of the season, have they? No. no. But what I think, I think Tuchel has played. He, we need our midfield needed needs to be changed. We play at a very very slow pace. Well, we have no creativity in central midfield. We've been saying no, it for a while. No, we've got nothing. No, well, we have Mason Mount. But, but Mason Mount's is, never played in there. The only time yeah. Mount's played in there has been recently when he's just looked a shadow of the player. Yeah, because his, his confidence has been ripped out of him. That's why. And, you know, he he's a quality player. And he looked... He, your first look as a midfield player, I was always taught, has got to be forward. If a ball's on, the passer... I'll tell you, does it really well. Hernandez uh, at Man United. If he sees someone going in... Oh, in, he did that ball. superbly against Arsenal on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's that ball. We've got no one in our midfield that does that. Everything is sideways, backwards. And our forwards are running like... like, And they're never getting the ball. We haven't got any pace down the flanks. We haven't... Well, we've got Sterling, but Sterling needs that number nine, needs that person in the middle to play off of. Another message that I did receive from somebody, and it did make me smile, was the situation between Tuchel and Lukaku. I wonder what Lukaku's thinking now. Oh, I'd be... Listen, football's a ruthless thing. He'd be laughing his head off. Could he come back? Yeah. If he got someone that... that if he got someone that gets the ball in... We did say, I, know, I did say on one of our... Well, quite a few of our pod, podcasts, 
You can criticise him all you like, but if he's not getting service into the box, which was his strength, what are you going to achieve? And people will look at him and say, oh, he's not doing anything. Because the service... Oh, yeah, we've get... been saying it for a while. I, I've, I've been there at Stamford Bridge last season. Yeah. He was getting no service at all. And he's just up there. And, he, and what happens is human instinct. If you're a centre forward and you're making runs and making runs and trying to create things and the ball's not coming, what do you do? Yeah. You stop making the runs. Yeah. You know, and that's to me, is what we've gone backwards because we're not playing forwards. And we're not hitting balls early. We're not trying to play players in. We score, you know, the goals that, that, that we scored against West Ham. It was because all of a sudden we had an outlet wide with a bit of pace. And that was Chilwell. And that ball, because we hmm. look forward and hit the ball early. Hmm. And we get a goal. And that's what we should be doing. That's well, let's another, hope. That's an unwritten law in football. When you receive a ball, your first look should be forward, not sideways. Bring back Jose, to be honest. Um... Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the bus at home games as well. He did. He was. He was. He, you know, we he was, won games though. Yeah, he did. But he was. He, <laughs> you know, with all due respect, the amount of times I heard Chelsea fans moaning because of the quality of the football we played. I remember going to see a Tottenham game, which was one of the greatest games and exciting games. And Carvalho scored a great goal after about eighteen minutes, and we shut up shop. And we were like the away game, the away team. And we parked the bus. And, the, and it was the most dreadful game I think I've seen at Stamford Bridge for a long, long time. But we won. Exactly. <laughs> but hold, it a minute, hold it a minute. Chelsea players, Chelsea fans didn't like that. In the end, they got sick of it. And they were saying the quality of the football that we were playing, it's a little bit like the West Ham thing. And the, you know, the quality of the football we were playing was dreadful. And that's what got rid of Jose. Because the chairman was up there and he was the same. But he got results. Exactly. The best job Jose did, I'll tell you, which went undetected, was he got Man United to second. Oh, yes. That was the best job he ever did, I'll tell you. And everyone criticised him, but I'll tell you what, that was a real feat that was to get them there. Well, we know Jose's not going to be there. It seems as if Mr. Graham Potter will, and if he does, by the time this come, goes out, good luck to him. He's going to need it because it's, it's a definite change from his own comfortable position at being at Brighton where, as you say, he goes on a bad run, he's going to be fine. He ain't going to be fine at Chelsea, but he knows what he's getting himself in for. So we shall see how it goes. One last but word. Remember, on... remember that Graham Potter turned down Tottenham, Keith. Well, he's got a bit of sense about him. You know, he's he's an intelligent guy. But it was he just one fight. Turned down Tottenham. Well, he's not the first person to turn down Tottenham. Yeah. William turned down Tottenham and they bought his flight. Um. <laughs> One last word on Tuchel. Where do you see him next? Do you think he'll come back to the Premier League one day? Do you think he'll have a break? Do you think he needs to sort his private life out, to be honest? and Or do, would you think he'll be back in the fold quite soon? I think he'll be back in the fold quite soon. I think his, 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 his CV is unbelievable. Although we didn't win cup finals, he got us the cup finals. As I said, for as a Chelsea fan to see us win to all the other clubs it didn't mean anything but they wouldn't have swapped it for the world the World Club Championship and the Champions League and the Super Cup he took us to we had we went to another level and he should never be forgotten and he should back be very back FA special Cup part finals of as well yeah yeah and I think uh, a guy with his CV uh, will 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 get a job. The only thing, the only question they got is the fallouts that you have. He wears his heart on his sleeve, and you know there's something wrong. 
It happened at PSG and it happened here. And I think that people will be a little bit concerned about that. But his CV is not a bad CV. And um, I'm sure he, he will get another job. And, you know, who, who, is there any jobs in England that that, um, that he'd be interested in? I'm sure when one comes up, a big one comes up, I think his name will be mentioned. Rightly so. Well, let's hope Tuchel enjoys the time he has to rest. Can I just recoup- as an example, Keith? Yes, of course you can. Go on. I'll just, I'll just say something to you. The worst thing I've ever seen from a Chelsea manager was Conte. When we went up to Man City and he never played a centre-forward. And we got and we, spanked, yeah. We were woeful. That's the worst management thing I've ever seen. And where is he now? Well, he's with and the horrible lot in North London. Are, yet, to be fair, we murdered them at Stamford Bridge. We were much the better side. And yet everyone's raving because they're scraping games. Luck's going their way a little bit. But we'll see. We'll see about them. We'll see. We shall see. We shall see how Potter does. <sighs> I'm I'm still a bit underwhelmed. I, I I just wish his first was Harry, and then he can get his wand out and win games for us. Well, if if the shit hits the fan, he can get his wand, get him a stick, and bugger off. Yeah. But <laughs> oh god, this it can only happen to us. Um, the two games we've got coming up, we'll just talk about them quickly. Fulham on Saturday, and it's not going to be an easy game against Fulham. Fulham are not the team that got relegated two years ago with a win part. They are a bit of a, a decent outfit now. And then we've got Salzburg in the Champions League. We possibly expect maybe Potter to first game to be against Salzburg. I can't see it being against Fulham, but you never know. How do you think Chelsea will go? Do you think there'll be a, a, a positive reaction to this, or do you think the mindset will still be a little bit, oh, we're, we'll just play for the sake of it type of thing? No, I think I think what happens, Keith, when, when, when a new manager's coming in, the players who have got the old managers as such think of themselves and think, I want to impress here, I want to be in the team. So you usually get, I think we beat Fulham, and I think we beat Salzburg, and very vital we beat because you can't you can't lose too many games in those qualifiers, especially at home. Um, and I think you're there will be an uplift and a better performance from Chelsea Football Club. Well, let's hope so, and let's hope the fans stick behind them. Um, for those going to the games, enjoy it as always. And to, it does make me laugh the amount of tickets that. Um, people are trying to sell for the Salzburg game, even after what happened last night was quite staggering. The amount of pings that I used, I was getting on these Chelsea ticket sites, these group chats, about three available, five available, nearly a whole bloody row available for tickets for the Salzburg. It was quite, a, it's quite astounding. Well, but uh, Yeah, but, but again, you know, we've got to look at ourselves as, as fans. You know, I've always said, probably the best atmosphere I've ever experienced in a cup final was when Liverpool played Chelsea uh, in the Millennium in a League Cup and it was unbelievable mm-hmm. and the difference is between some Chelsea fans is that no matter what happens to Liverpool there would be a full house every game and that's what makes a club great is their supporters Here, hear Totally agree with that. So we hope you enjoyed. This was going to be a rant, bearing in mind if the, the plans I had in place after last night, travelling back from one of the games I was uh, scouting at. But we hope you enjoyed today's episode, this special episode of the Blue Day podcast. And Steve, while this comes out, we're celebrating our second anniversary of the show. I can't believe it's been two years. The fact that when I started this along with my previous co-host 
who I hope is doing well at the moment because I've not spoke to him properly for a long, long time. I hope he's okay. I, I'm still staggered that when news like like this breaks, I get ex-Chelsea players contact me. That's quite surreal. And even when Chelsea lose or Chelsea win trophies, when we won the Champions League, you called me. Ten years ago, I would have only dream to have ex-Chelsea players contact me and go, my God, we've won the Champions League, for example. Would never have dreamed it. But I've enjoyed it doing this show. It's been stressful. Where and you know you know from certain uh, stories that I've told you it's been stressful, but I've forged good friendships with people. Some not so great, but we'll we'll worry about that another time. But on the show, I just want to say on our second anniversary, Steve, thank you for being my co-host. It's been an absolute pleasure, and here's hoping for a few more anniversaries coming up on the show. I'm sure there will be. Chelsea will live on and be great for years to come. Well, let's hope the podcast is as well. Can I just say uh, a special little thing? I, I just want to wish Johnny Hollins and his family all the best. Um, John's not well at the moment, and I've met Chris and him, and I just send them my love and, and wish all the best to them. Yeah. And if you're a fan of this show and you're wondering when's the next player interview going to be out, well, this week we have a special interview with none other than Gary Stanley, a man that you know well, Steve, and we did discuss you quite a bit when I saw him last week down at Portsmouth. He was kind enough. We did a live interview down at Portsmouth at the Queen's Hotel, very extravagant hotel as well, I must add. Fabulous person to speak to. He was going talking about a lot of the history with Chelsea Great stories about yourself, Kenny Swain, Ray Wilkins, Eddie McCready. It was it was great to speak to him. Just to sort of end the show on a positive note and not talk about the doom and gloom of Tuchel. What stories have you got of the great Gary Stanley, the man who, you know what? If I am his age and I st- and I have that set of hair, I will die a happy man. Well, we always we always fall. About you know when we were all single, by the way, when we weren't, you know, <laughs> we <clears throat> you always wanted to follow Stanners in second because you knew full well that the moment he walked into a bar, a nightclub, all the girls just went, "Wow!" <laughs> he was he was really the first David Beckham. He was a uh, he was um, and had such a way about him, and he, he'd say to go, "You're all right, love," and that was it. They were smitten, and he was. Uh, he, he had everything, Gary. He was a, a very good foot, footballer. Probably not a little bit underrated at Chelsea. And, and when he went to Everton and went to Swansea, he did really well. But he was a very quick, great shot with either feet. Good in the air for someone that was probably five foot eleven. Hmm. Uh, but a great lad. Uh, absolutely smashing lad. Uh, and there was a thing in those days where no matter what our differences were, on a Saturday when you shook hands, my God, you went out and you gave 100% for each other. And Stannis was one of those. He'd give everything. Well, that show is going to be out on the 8th of September. So it'll probably be out by the time you guys will be listening to this as it's the uh, anniversary of the show. And we're hopefully going to have one or two more surprises coming up, which will hopefully be announced soon. But Steve... Thank you very much for today. Hopefully, the next time we speak and talk about Chelsea, we'll be in a bit of a better place. And hopefully, Mr. Potter will play players in their right positions and actually get us scoring goals for a change and not conceding stupid goals and playing two 30, 30 year olds as the centre back pair. And let's hope we have a bit of a change in fortune with Chelsea. Yeah. Here, here. Here. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode, fellow Chelsea supporters. Stay safe and carefree.